It is Fantasy Football Championship Week for a lot of you, but for some of you, the guys that weren't fortunate enough to make your Fantasy Football Championship, you might be left scratching your heads. What's next for the Fantasy Football season? Of course, Dynasty content will be coming fast and furious the second the season is over, but playoff best ball is the funnest, most exciting way to still be playing Fantasy Football into the NFL playoffs. And if, those, if for those of you guys that are wondering, where's my you know matchups that matter? Where's my tier list content? Don't worry, that will be coming in the coming days for those of you that are in the fantasy championship but today we are going to talk about some playoff best ball strategy over on underdog fantasy but before we do let's hit the intro All right, so I'm going to kick things off for playoff best ball with the absolute basics because I'm sure a lot of you guys have never heard of it. Maybe you're watching this video trying to figure out more about it and, you know, the strategy that goes into it. But I'm going to start with the absolute bare essentials as if you guys know nothing about playoff best ball coming into this video. We're going to start with what is playoff best ball? What exactly are we talking about? What is it? Um, it's just like regular best ball, essentially. So regular season long best ball where you draft a team, it requires no maintenance, there's no waivers, there's no start sit decisions. The software automatically starts your best lineup every single week and you draft as many teams as you want because there's no in-season management or no in-playoffs management in this case and you just sweat the results out. Only instead of the regular season format where... There's 18 roster spots, and you know you start a typical fantasy roster of one quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, one flex, one tight end spot. Instead, you're drafting a 10-round draft, trying to essentially predict the results of the NFL playoffs. The starting spots are the same regardless of which contest on underdog you're looking at, whether it's the mitten, the gauntlet, the big mitten, the little gauntlet, whatever. You start one quarterback, one running back, two wide receivers slash tight end. So there is no tight end spot specifically. They are grouped in with wide receiver and then one flex spot, meaning you can only start a maximum of two running backs, maximum of one quarterback and a maximum of three wide receivers to tight ends per round. Essentially, when you're playing playoff best ball, you have three goals in mind. The first two goals, very simple. Number one, you are trying to predict who makes the Super Bowl. Because round four is where the top of the money pool ends up. 33% of the cash is actually in that final round. Number two, you're trying to draft players that score a lot of fantasy points, right? Sounds easy so far. But number three is where all of the strategy comes in. Goal number three of playoff best ball is the tough one. It's where you're trying to construct your team in a way that will both give you a path to advance in each round. Round one, the wild card round. Round two, the divisional round. Round three, the NFC and AFC championship. And then, of course, eventually make the Super Bowl where all the money is. But you're also tasked with walking the tightrope of, you know, advancing to the Super Bowl and also having a big time starting roster in the Super Bowl. So it's not as easy as saying, I think the Cowboys and Chiefs are going to make the Super Bowl. I'm going to draft six Dallas Cowboys and four Kansas City Chiefs because you got to get to the Super Bowl to be able to reap the rewards if you predicted the Super Bowl correctly, as well as the fact that sometimes it's not possible to draft all of the best Cowboys players, all of the best Chiefs players, all of the best 49ers players, especially because the ADPs are skewed as such that the best teams go highly and the bad teams go low. So that is why there is so much involved strategy wise with playoff best ball. It's a relatively new concept, but it is so, so fun. So I'm excited to tell you guys exactly what all goes into it. So we're going to start with contest selection because there's two major contests on Underdog Fantasy that I'm sure will appeal to you guys, beginners, in playoff best ball. And that is the Mitten, which is a $5 entry contest, and the Gauntlet, which is a $25 entry contest. There's also the Little Gauntlet, which is $50 entry, and the Big Mitten, which is $250 entry. But I'm assuming if you guys are watching this video, you're probably more interested in the large field, you know, small buy-in but big prizes kind of contest. The Mitten 2 is the current contest that is active as of the day that I'm recording this. I'm sure there'll be a third Mitten or Mitten Returns and all these other kind of contests that comes out. But again, rules to be aware of in this contest because we, of course, before we go into these drafts, we want to know exactly what we're getting into going into the contest. It is a $5 entry in the Mitten 2. $25,000 to first. The field size, there's like 55,000 people in the contest. As I talked about already, it's different from regular season best ball because they are not cumulative points. Points. So in regular season best ball, weeks 1 to 14, you get all of the points scored in those weeks. In playoff best ball, it's a four-round tournament. So you get all of your points that you score on wildcard weekend. That advances you to the next round if you advance. All of your points scored on divisional round weekend are completely brand new. None of your wildcard round points count. 
you have to advance in that round. AFC and NFC Championship round, all new points, non-cumulative. You have to get into the next round, which is then the Super Bowl. And of course, if you come in first place, you win the grand prize. Round one, you need to be top two of your six-man drafting pod to advance to the divisional round. Important to note because last year, you were not actually top two. In the gauntlet tournament last year, you had to be the first place of your six-man drafting pod. They have actually changed up the rules this year so that it is universal. It's top two out of six for each contest. And of course, in round one, because you need to be top two out of six, that is important information to know because the 49ers and the Baltimore Ravens, as it currently stands, are on track to not play in round one of the NFL playoffs because they have the first round bye in their respective conferences. Of course, that could change, but as it right as it stands right now, 49ers and Ravens, you won't be able to use in round one. In round two, in the mitten two, you have to be one out of 10. So a 10% inherent odds to advance out of the divisional round. Round three is also one out of 10 in the conference championship round culminating in a 186-person final, the winner taking home the grand prize of $25,000 on their $5 entry. So that is all the rules with the mitten two. If you want to you know, up your bankroll a little bit and go up to the gauntlet, which is a $25 entry, if instead of drafting, say, 10 teams for $5 each and you, get it, uh, and you can uh, spend $50, you can draft only two teams in the gauntlet tournament. The difference in this contest is that it's a $25 entry. The field size is a little bit larger. As you guys can see there, there is uh, 67,000 people in the contest, and the grand prize is 150000 instead of 25000 to first. Still a four-round tournament like the Mitten was, Wild Card, Divisional, AFC, and NFC Championship, and then, of course, the big game, the Super Bowl. The rounds, though, are not structured the same. So instead of um, 1 out of 10 and 1 out of 10 in round 2 and 3, round 1, just like the mitten, you need to be top two out of your six-man drafting pod. In round two, it's actually better than the mitten in terms of inherent odds because you need to be top two out of 14 instead of one out of 10. So a one in seven chance essentially to make it out of round two. And then round three is one out of eight chance instead of one out of 10 again, culminating in a 400-person final instead of 186-person final with the winner taking home, of course, the grand prize of 150000 on their $25 entry. I won't go through like the contest structure and rules of the little gauntlet and the big mitten in depth because they're more mid and higher stakes playoff best ball contests where the field size is much smaller. But of course, you can read that on Underdog Fantasy's homepage. Both contests are top two in advance in round one, but the round two to four uh, pod sizes are smaller than the other contests that I just broke down. So that's the basics of playoff best ball. Hopefully I'm not confusing anybody. Now let's get into the actual strategy. So let's say you've picked your contest. You're going to do 10 drafts in the mitten, or you're going to do five drafts in the gauntlet, whatever your strategy is for contest selection. Now let's get into actual strategy once you're in the draft room. So number one is roster construction. I'm going to go through that first. Number two strategy kind of pillar we're going to go through is team selection. So how to pick your Super Bowl teams and work through that. Number three, I'm going to break down seven rules to follow for success in these drafts. And then number four, I'll talk about the cheat sheet that I made if you guys are drafting ASAP because it's not week 17 yet. We still have to predict some things that might happen that might impact playoff seeding and all that kind of stuff. And I've simplified it so that your brain doesn't explode mid-draft when you're drafting a Dolphins player and you're like, wait a minute, are they going to play the um, Chiefs in the next round? I don't exactly remember. Everything will be covered for you in that cheat sheet. So we're going to kick things off with roster construction. And if you don't know what I mean by that, essentially what we're talking about is how many quarterbacks do you want to draft? How many running backs do you want to draft? How many wide receivers and tight ends do you want to draft to make the optimal lineup? So again, it is a 10-man player roster. It's 60 pl uh, picks overall in a six-man drafting pod. There's 10 players on each team. Five of those players are going to start on any given week. One quarterback, one running back, two wide receivers slash tight ends, so no individual tight end spot, and one flex. Roster construction may differ depending on the teams that you actually choose to select because if you have, let's say, a Baltimore Ravens team, then you're going to need a second quarterback because the Ravens, as of now, are on track to not play in the first round of the NFL playoffs. Here's a team of mine in the big mitten to give you guys an idea of what team construction can look like. 
Ideal roster construction is one to two quarterbacks, depending on if you have Purdy or Lamar as it currently stands. The two teams that get a bye, you'll need a second quarterback, obviously. But because I have Dak Prescott, they're not likely to get a bye, so I'm cool just rolling with one quarterback. Dak is my anchor. Two to three running backs, again, taking into account bye weeks. You don't want to draft both Gus Edwards and Christian McCaffrey and no other running backs because then you won't have a running back for round one, and you do need to start one on any given week. And then you want to load up with five to seven wide receiver slash tight ends because you have to start two every single week and up to three every single week if you want to utilize your flex spot in that manner. So the other team that you guys can see there is an example of a two quarterback build because I have Brock Purdy. I needed a second quarterback. I grab Josh Allen and stack up a Brock Purdy uh, San Francisco 49er stack with a Buffalo Bills um, stack there as well. So that's roster construction. Again, optimally one to two quarterbacks, two to three running backs, probably don't go more than three if possible. And then five to seven wide receivers and tight ends. Allocate your roster spots accordingly and make sure that you're structuring your teams in that way. When it comes to team selection. So again, your ultimate goal goal in this tournament is to win the championship. You're trying to win in the Super Bowl round, so you need to predict essentially who's going to make the Super Bowl. And exactly what I did with Dak in the Big Mitten team that I showed you already, you'll notice how I've selected my Super Bowl matchup. I have three Cowboys players, including Dak Prescott as my main quarterback because I need a quarterback in that Super Bowl matchup. Then I have three Kansas City Chiefs players. So I have a three by three Dallas Cowboys, Kansas City Chiefs is my Super Bowl matchup that I'm gunning for. I have at least one running back from that team as well. I know it's Jarek McKinnon. I Obviously, I would rather have Pollard or Pacheco, but that's not how the draft fell to me in this particular room. And then I loaded up on wide receivers and tight ends. If this scenario plays out and we get a Dallas, Kansas City Super Bowl, as I'm predicting here, I can field a roster of Dak, McKinnon, CeeDee Lamb, Travis Kelsey, Jake Ferguson, and Justin Watson. Your goal with these drafts is to build out these scenarios and kind of double down on your stances. So when I selected C.D. Lamb with my first pick at pick number four, I'm inherently betting on the Cowboys to make it far in the NFL playoffs. Do I think Dallas and Kansas City will be the likely Super Bowl? Not necessarily, but sometimes it isn't possible to always stack the San Francisco 49ers and with the Buffalo Bills if that's what I think the Super Bowl is going to be. So you have to take time to account for ADP value and adjust your strategy on the fly based on on what teams are falling to you at what point in the draft. You also might notice with this team specifically that I, in addition to the three Cowboys players and the three Kansas City Chiefs players that I took, I also took one-off players from four other teams, likely Cup, Swift, and Gibbs. You can play it like this if you want to. Honestly, I'm not overly happy with this draft and hope that you kind of predict the big performances, right? Like that's kind of what I'm trying to do with this draft where I think, you know, maybe I get two big performances from Cooper Cup or maybe I get a big performance from DeAndre Swift or Jameer Gibbs. Ideally, it'll be hard to advance teams teams without Cooper Cup in that first game because he goes like, you know, seven for 170 and two touchdowns. But again, I'm kind of galaxy braining with this team because I'm not overly happy with it. The point is, I'm hoping one of Detroit or Philadelphia make the NFC Championship against the Cowboys in this scenario of my team so that I only have to use McKinnon for that one game because McKinnon's not really that great of a fantasy player. It'll be hard to rely on him for the entirety of the NFL playoffs. Let's look at another example team that I'm a little bit more happy with. With this team, I ended up drafting a second quarterback, even though neither team is likely to get a bye. This may work. Let's say if Josh Allen runs hot from divisional round all the way to the Super Bowl, and he has a dud in week one of the playoffs, because let's say James Cook punches in three touchdowns or something. But I'm kind of galaxy braining right now. Ideally, if I draft Josh Allen, I probably shouldn't have drafted a second quarterback. But regardless, the main focus of this section is my team selection. So on this team, I have three Buffalo Bills, Allen, Diggs, and James Cook. I stacked them up on the NFC side with the Detroit Lions, Jared Goff, Amon Ross St. Brown, and Jamison Williams. I can field a five-man starting roster in the Super Bowl with actually an extra quarterback in the bag. But the difference between this team and the last team where I took a bunch of one-offs is that I can also field a second Super Bowl matchup of the Buffalo Bills with Tony Pollard and CeeDee Lamb on the Cowboys side. So I can also field a Buffalo-Detroit Super Bowl in addition to a Buffalo um, Dallas Super Bowl. And that's why I like this team a little bit better is that I actually have two outs for the Super Bowl matchup. Plus, in addition to that, I also got one-off spike performers like Nico Collins and Brandon Ayuk. This team is definitely not possible to draft anymore because I drafted this team back in week 14 when I was in Montreal. And it's definitely dangerous given how high Diggs, Allen, and Cook have 
risen in ADP since then. But if you recall back in week 14, the Buffalo Bills had to play Kansas City and Dallas in the coming two games. And people thought, hey, maybe they're not going to actually make the playoffs. And of course, Dallas and um, Kansas City both lost those games. So good news for this team that I was able to get that discount on those Buffalo Bills players. And that's the benefit of drafting early is that if you predict things right, your team can be a juggernaut. But of course, if you predict wrong, then this could have been a dead team because I drafted all those Buffalo Bills players and they might not have made the playoffs altogether. And then one more final example of a team that I drafted is one that I actually made a mistake with. I didn't account for the fact that the 49ers had a buy. So even though I can field a starting roster in the Super Bowl, if it were to be, say, the San Francisco 49ers versus the Miami Dolphins with five players that I have from those two teams, instead of taking Michael Gallup where I took him, I should have taken a second quarterback because the 49ers have a buy. I want to have a, a first round quarterback because Purdy will be on buy and this team might be dead on arrival. So even though I like this team, if it does advance out of round one, it's hard to get a top two team when you don't have a quarterback in the first round, unless I absolutely predicted the nuts performer of like Calvin Ridley that week, it's going to be very challenging. So again, this is something that you don't want to do. If you draft a, a 49ers player, uh, a 49ers quarterback or a Ravens quarterback right now who are on track to get the buy, you probably need a second quarterback. So that's roster construction and team selection. Hopefully I'm not confusing everybody right now, but we're going to go through seven rules to follow if you guys are new to playoff best ball to just keep these things in mind when you're drafting. Rule number one, don't draft scared. Don't draft a second or a third quarterback just in case of injury or just in case that team gets eliminated or don't take that one-off Justin Jefferson because you want the points in round one. Take some stances for your portfolio and if you you know, draft a certain scenario. If you think the Buffalo Bills are going far in the playoffs and you draft as such, then you have to stick to that scenario. If the Bills don't make it far, your team is dead anyway. There's no point in trying to salvage a min cash. Number two, take some stances if you can. I think this is something that's really, really important because it can really raise the ceiling and the floor of your portfolio of teams. And your portfolio of teams doesn't have to be 150 drafts. It can be five drafts. It can be 10 drafts, however many you can afford to do. If you think the Chiefs suck this year and they're not going far in the playoffs, then don't draft draft any Kansas City Chiefs. If you think the Cowboys are going all the way this year, then draft a lot of Dallas Cowboys. Definitely take some stances in your portfolio because it will really reward you if you can do it properly. My personal stances this year is to fade the Baltimore Ravens, number one, because they have a first round bye. And number two, I could see them losing in the divisional round and that would kill a lot of NFL uh, playoff best ball teams. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm also fading the Chiefs because I don't think they're very good this year. I'm attacking the 49ers and Cowboys where I can. And I do think the Bills and the Rams are good sleeper offenses to go after as well. So those are some of my personal stances that I am trying to exploit in these drafts. Rule number three is be calculated. If you're going to take a one-off player who's fallen past ADP, let's say you're in the 30s and Amon Ross St. Brown is still on the board and you're like, you know what? I'm going to take this one off even if I only get one or two games out of him. He could absolutely be worth it because he projects really well. Do it when necessary, but don't do it more than one or two times. Like I said already with that one team, I did four one-offs and I don't really feel good about that. What I should have done instead is consolidated those into two individual stacks of two players instead of taking four one-offs um, because that's me drafting scared. And I made that mistake already and I don't want to do that anymore. Number four, tell a story with your draft picks. So what I mean by telling a story is if you start your draft at the end of round one, let's say you draw the six pick and you draft Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey at the six, seven turn, you are inherently betting on the Chiefs to make the Super Bowl. By drafting those players, you need to uh, play out the scenario that the Kansas City Chiefs align with that decision that you made. In practice, that means things like pivoting to an NFC stack, right? So you drafted your two AFC players there, Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. You can then pivot in round three and four when you get back on the clock and maybe draft, um, you know, DeAndre Swift and Devontae Smith to build out a Kansas City Chiefs and Philadelphia Eagles Super Bowl. This also means things like avoiding a team that the Kansas City Chiefs might play in the first round of the playoffs. For example, right now they're the three seed. They would be on track to play the Buffalo Bills, who are the current six seed. So if you draft Kansas City Chiefs, maybe you want to avoid the Buffalo Bills. And also, not overloading the AFC side of things in general because you're already betting on the Chiefs to go far in the AFC side of the playoff picture. And of course, the final easy one is that you draft more Kansas City Chiefs. If you draft draft Kelsey and Mahomes, maybe Rasheed Rice falls back to you, or maybe later on in the draft, you take Jarek McKinnon, or you take Clyde edwards helaire or you take Justin Watson, whatever. You're, you're inherently betting on the Chiefs to make the Super Bowl, so double down on that bet with your other decisions. And number five rule is work from the Super Bowl backwards. So 
whatever you do with your first couple picks, because generally speaking, the teams that are likely to go to the Super Bowl will be drafted highly. You want to work from the Super Bowl backwards, ideally allocating five to seven of your 10 roster spots to two teams, one AFC, one NFC, so that you can field a starting roster, whether it's four players from the Chiefs, two players from the Cowboys, three players from the Chiefs, three players from the Cowboys. It doesn't really matter. You just want to work from the Super Bowl backward and then try and allocate your one-offs or your other mini stacks elsewhere along the way. Rule number six is if you get sniped and lose your stacks, say you drafted Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, and Raheem Mostert, and you were just praying that Tua fell to you and he didn't, what you are better off doing as opposed to just tilting and drafting a bunch of players to try and salvage a min cash is pivoting to a lower ranked team who's going to be lower on an ADP to make a Super Bowl run. So let's say that's exactly what happened. You have Raheem Mostert, Tyree Kill, and Jalen Waddle, And Tua Tungavailoa gets sniped because some moron took Tua Tungavailoa when he already has Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown. What you should do instead is because you have three AFC players already, you should pivot to a lower owned NFC team and try and build out their stack. So Matthew Stafford, Cooper Cup, Puka Nakua, or Matthew Stafford, Kyron Williams, Puka Nakua, whatever. Or maybe you don't believe in Matthew Stafford. Maybe you want um, Baker Mayfield, Mike Evans, and Rashad White or something like that. You are better off trying to do that because if you do get a unique Super Bowl matchup, and this happened two years ago with the Cincinnati Bengals, not a lot of people were on them to make the Super Bowl, and they eventually went on a run and did it, then you can potentially have a very unique team in the Super Bowl matchup. And if you do get a Miami Dolphins Buccaneers Super Bowl, then that would be a very unique team, and not a lot of people will have planned for that. So again, you're better off pivoting when your strategy goes awry as opposed to just drafting the best best ball players you can find and salvaging a min cash. And then finally, rule number seven, and this one's kind of optional uh, optional because it's definitely debatable if this is optimal or not. But in my opinion, I would rather draft five or six players in the Super Bowl matchup and try and get as many teams to the Super Bowl as possible, as opposed to trying to advance five Cowboys and five Chiefs or something like that. Overstacking, in my opinion, is suboptimal. And this could go either way because if you do predict it correctly and you get lucky in your pods, it could work. But for me, these contests are difficult to get to the Super Bowl. And understanding that, you have a 2-6 and six chance to get out of round one. You have a 2-14 and 14 chance to get out of round two. A 1-8 and eight chance to get out of round three. And that's in the gauntlet where it's actually easier to advance to the Super Bowl than the mitten. In my opinion, you got a 1% chance inherent odds to make the Super Bowl. So I would rather have a three Cowboys, two Chiefs, or a three Cowboys, three Chiefs, or something like that, or a four by two team if possible to make it there because I picked my one-offs and my mini stacks appropriately. And I have to hit the nuts just one time in the big game when it really counts. A lot of people are trying to hit the nuts three separate times, round one, round two, and round three, just to be able to field eight, nine, 10 players in the Super Bowl. And in my opinion, it's way harder to get a team to the Super Bowl by doing that. It could happen, but I don't think it's very likely. So to close this video out, I want to remind you, do not overstack. Your Super Bowl matchup should be five to seven players, no more, in my opinion. Again, that could go either way. Maybe you can get a team with eight, nine, ten players, but I think you're going to burn a lot more entries doing that than you will be trying to uh, to go with my strategy. And of course, we have tons of playoff best ball drafts streamed on the channel. We did one yesterday. Uh, we did three of them yesterday if you want to check them out but we will be doing more in the coming weeks. And to close this video out, I want to showcase the cheat sheet that I made in case you guys are excited to start drafting right away. Because if you're trying to draft right now, after week 16, as I'm recording this, before week 17, you need to be properly prepared because things can change. Seeding can change. Players can miss the playoffs altogether. I realize it's overwhelming to try and predict who's going to play who in the first round and who's going to play who in the second round and what teams are going to make the playoffs, what teams are going to miss the playoffs, who's going to get a bye, what's the rest of the season schedules. All that stuff is overwhelming. So I collected all that information for you guys, and it's free for you to view in the pinned comments. So you can use it as a companion to help you draft. It's everything from playoff odds to division uh, winning percentage to buy percentage to the remaining opponents that teams have to go up against. If you want to try and predict who's going to make the playoffs and who's going to miss the playoffs, what seed those teams are most likely to be, some notes that you can have on those teams and what I think on them, uh, teams that you should be pairing with them as well. So if you draft Cowboys, who are the best teams to go after um, with the Cowboys, aside from the obvious pair them with AFC teams, what teams are actually safe to pair them with on the NFC side of things. So, so if you draft players from the 49ers, for example, you might be wondering what NFC teams are safe to pair with the 49ers. You sh you want to avoid drafting the Cowboys. You want to avoid drafting the Bucks and the Rams and the Seahawks because if they get out of the first round, they're most likely to see the, the 49ers in round two. The safer opponents to, to take 
in the 49ers uh, case, if you draft 49ers players on the NFC side, is going after the Eagles or the Lions because they're not likely to play each other until the NFC Championship. And that's what this cheat sheet outlines. So, and of course, if you guys want to jump right into these drafts and get some skin into this playoff best ball scene, I'm telling you, it's a ton of fun. And there's a lot of casuals in here that are easily exploitable, which is why I like it more than regular best ball because the Sharps have really started to take over regular best ball in recent years. But this is one area that the Sharps are not in yet. So if you want to check out Underdog Fantasy and you want to get involved in playoff best ball drafts, make sure to use promo code FSE when you sign up. New users get 100% back up to $100 when you use our promo code, as well as a special pick em, uh, slip that you can use this Sunday. So you guys can see it there. Half a total yard for Dak Prescott. That'll boost your pick em entry if you want to use it as a new user. When you use promo code FSE, you'll get access to it. But with that being said, peace out, and I'll talk to you soon.